We were just wondering that, but we got a few minutes for the before we get into heavy stuff. <coughs> okay. I'll call to order uh, the Village of Lake Bluff Sustainability and um, Community Enhancement Ad Hoc Committee for Wednesday, November 28th, 2018. Uh, can I get a roll call, please? Sure. Member Patterson? Here. Member Johnson is absent. Member Bishop? Here. Member Sorensen? Here. Member Twitchell is absent. Co Chair Purrier? Here. And Co Chair Renner? Here. You have a quorum. Okay. First up on the agenda is a consideration of the August 29th, 2018 regular meeting minutes. Uh, any comments, additions to those meeting minutes? If not, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, next up is consideration of the October 3rd, 2018 regular meeting minutes. Any comments, additions, changes? If not, could I get a motion to approve? Move, <laughs> Move it <second>. along. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, 15, we allow 15 minutes for any non-agenda items. Anyone <clears throat> who wants to speak on something that is not on the agenda tonight. Okay. Seeing no one will get to the uh, order of the meeting. Um, if there's any request to change the order, uh, which I don't think we do, but uh, we'll entertain that now. Okay. Take it away. Sure. So this evening we're pre pleased to welcome Katie Boat um, to talk to us about um, sustainable lighting practices, nighttime lighting, outdoor lighting, things of that nature. Um, Katie is an electrical engineer and a lighting designer here with um, Smith Group in Chicago, so her expertise is in um, net zero development. She has some lead platinum projects that she's done before. She worked with clients including the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, General Motors, Microsoft, um, Georgetown University, American University, and the University of Kansas. So um, definitely knows her stuff in the world of lighting. Um, she's here to talk to us as we've started some of our conversations around um, dark sky lighting and outdoor lighting ordinances. Um, just to give us a primer on, on how that works for businesses, um, some of the concepts to keep in mind, and um, we'll walk through things of that nature. So, glad to have Katie join us. Thanks for the introduction. Let me get connected here. Reverse, reverse. <laughs> We're going to get off the presentation mode then. Let's see. One sec, let me see if I can. Oh, no. I think your screen's set to duplicate right now. Yeah, yeah. I need to go back to my. You got me. <clears throat> back to the beginning here. We're good. Okay, uh, so again, my name is Katie Boat. Um, I work at Smith Group downtown. Um, I work with Brian. We've been working there together for about four years. Um, and we do a ton of both interior and exterior lighting projects um, in the city and beyond all over the country, actually. So I'm gonna talk about um, some sustainability practices for lighting, specifically outdoor lighting and also just kind of give you some background on like terminology and codes and things like that with regard to exterior lighting. 
Okay, so here's kind of an overview of what we're gonna run through. Um, basics, like I said, terminology, codes and standards, control types, um, and then outdoor lighting types, um, talk about light pollution and trespass and kind of what the difference is between those, um, and then touch on what are the goals for communities with their outdoor lighting. Um, then we'll go over some policy examples. So the model lighting ordinance, um, I think that's a, a primary agenda topic and then talk about some nearby communities that have implemented this. Okay, so I'm gonna overwhelm you with some terminology right away, but this will be good so that we all are on the same page throughout the presentation. Um, so, <laughs> so first thing, we talk about the IES all the time in lighting. That's the Illuminating Engineering Society. I brought a prop. Um, it is their handbook, so they have a lot to say about lighting. Um, we refer to this book all the time. They also produce tons of supplements to it, which is hard to believe that there's not everything you need in here. Um, but they're not a governing body. They're, they produce a standard. So this is something that can be adopted in part or in whole um, by you know municipalities or AHJs or whatever. Um, so it's really a reference. Uh, the IDA is the International Dark Sky Association. It's a nonprofit advocacy group. Um, so again, they don't produce a stand or a code. They produce um, standards that can be used by municipalities, um, and then they just kind of in general advocate for their cause, which is protect basically protecting the night sky. So undoing what they see as the damage that we've done. Um, the MLO is the Model Lighting Ordinance. That's the standard that the IDA produced that can be pretty much readily incorporated into a code. Um, and then when we do talk about codes, typically for energy code, we're gonna be talking about ASHRAE 90.1 or IECC. ASHRAE 90.1 is a standard. Um, it's the energy standard for buildings except low-rise residential buildings, so pretty much everything we talk about in the commercial world. Um, and then IECC is the International Energy Conservation Code, and Illinois actually adopts the 2015 version of the IECC, which within that also allows you to use ASHRAE 90.1 as an alternate path of compliance. So you could really use either one. You can't pick and choose parts from one to the other, but you could go whole hog with either one. Um, foot candles, this is the standard unit of illuminance, which is basically how much light is hitting a surface. Uh, so we talk about foot candles all the time. Um, another unit similar to foot candles is lux. That's, it's the same type of measurement, it's just one foot candle is 10 lux, so that's basically the only difference. Um, a lumen, it's also a measurement of illuminance, but it's it's the amount of light being emitted from a source, it's not the amount of light hitting a surface. So that's the difference there. Um, photometry, we typically do calculations to develop plans showing point by point what the light levels are gonna be for a site. So that's photometry. You can, you'll also see photometry for, you know, on a fixture cut sheet, for instance, showing you how is the light emitted from this fixture, what does the pattern look like, what are the levels, that's also photometry. Okay. Um, color temperature, so this is becoming a more and more prevalent um, topic of concern in exterior lighting. Color temperature is the perceived color of light and the unit that it's measured in is Kelvin, so it's called degrees Kelvin. Um, I was running out of room in my little box there, so I've got a, like SAT style uh, <laughs> definition. But basically, your higher Kelvin temperatures um, correspond to your cooler light, so your bluer light. Your lower Kelvin temperatures correspond to your warmer light. So like a typical incandescent bulb in your house would be like 2700 Kelvin. If you're talking about daylight, you're getting up to like 10,000 Kelvin. So that's how it works. Um, CRI is the color rendering index. That's basically how well light is rendering or representing color as it would be represented in natural light. So, I mean, obviously if you dim an incandescent bulb, everything gets a little warmer and glowier, your color rendering goes down. If you've got one of those daylight bulbs, your color rendering's better. Um, and then we get into controls. So a time clock, I think everybody probably knows what this is. 
It's a device that is going to switch your lights on and off automatically based on time. That could be an astronomic time clock or it could just be a, you know, literally a dial style timer. Um, an occupancy sensor is a device that is going to switch your lights on and off based on the presence of people. There's a few different types. We'll touch on those a little bit later. Um, and then we've got a few different types of lighting that are pretty common for exterior applications. Um, HID is high intensity discharge lighting. Um, that's typically like metal halide. You'll see that a lot in exterior um, projects. It's, it's at this point getting kind of outdated um, and there are some disadvantages. I'll talk about those as well. Um, fluorescent lighting, obviously we're all familiar with that. Very common in interior applications. Um, it's also used outside quite a bit. It does have um, a mercury content, so that's a downside. There's some other issues with it as well. Um, and then LED, obviously that's the most prevalent light source at this point in time. It's kind of been developing over the last 15 years, um, and it's really pretty much taken the industry over. So solid state lighting, LED lighting, um, they're both a, the term, different terms for um, the same type of light, which is just a semiconductor source. Okay, so we're through that, that's good. Um, all right, so we'll talk about the codes and standards first a little bit. Um, IECC, as I mentioned, that's what's adopted by Illinois. So when, you know, for instance, when we're doing a project, we have to comply with IECC, which, as I mentioned, gives us the option to pursue ASHRAE instead. Um, but the section that's relevant is the C405.5.1. Um, and that's what's going to deal with exterior lighting. So basically, the, the main issues are they want to make sure that your wattage is restricted to a certain amount. And that's going to be contingent on the type of project that you're doing and the location. Um, so as it says up there, it's by lighting zone. And they define very specific lighting zones. Um, and then there are some exclusions. We don't need to go through all of those. But they're basically the things you would expect that aren't functional lighting. Um, so these are the lighting zones. Um, we've got one through four, and they just go in increasing order of um, population density, basically. So you're starting at zone one, which is, um, they say, developed areas of national parks. So it's the most rural, rural you're going to be where they would expect lighting to happen. Um, lighting zone two would be residential neighborhood business districts, um, light industrial. I don't think that's something that I often encounter. Um, and then residential mixed use. Three is where they put everything that doesn't fit in one, two, or four, which is kind of goofy, but things do fall into three as a result. Um, four is basically your really busy commercial district. So if we're talking about the loop, it's going to be lighting zone four. Um, okay. And then we don't need to go through all of these, but basically by zone, they're going to tell you how much lighting you can use. And that's going to be on a watts per square foot basis. Um, or as you can see, for some of these, it's like a watts per linear foot. So if you're talking about a sidewalk or something, it's going to say, OK, if your sidewalk's this long, you get this many watts per foot of length. So. Real quick, Katie. Sure. So is that an efficiency measurement, or is that the old watts are lumens goofiness? Back before, back when we had incandescent bulbs. Well, it's it's purely going to be based on your power consumption. So it doesn't matter how efficacious your fixture is. If, you know, regardless of how many lumens are coming out, if your fixture is consuming 30 watts, say, you're going to have to count 30 watts in this calculation. And sometimes, like for fluorescent fixtures, um, like the the ballast will have some inefficiency, so you'll lose you know ten percent of your power essentially in the ballast. So you're 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 using the energy, but you're not seeing it in the form of visible light. Actually, you're not seeing a lot of energy in general in in the form of visible light, but you do still have to count it. So does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, so the IECC separates building facade and landscape lighting, which makes sense when you think about their goal. They're trying to reduce lighting that is not necessary. 
So building facade and landscape lighting could be considered a little bit more decorative. Um, so they require, ICC requires that uh, that type of lighting is reduced by 30%. And that's not output, that's actually power consumption. So you have to make sure that you're you're not reducing just your lumens, you're reducing your wattage. Um, and that, they, they do prescribe the time frame for that. So it's either from midnight to 6 a.m. or it's from one hour, one hour after your business closes if that's later than midnight. And then it can be turned back on one hour before your business opens if that's before 6 a.m. So theoretically, I mean, some facilities stay open 24 hours. They can have their lights on all night. Um, but, you know, if you're, let's say, a school and you've closed at 3, you can only have your lights on until midnight. So. Oh, and then, importantly, the last bullet point is they must be reduced by 30% after 15 minutes when no occupancy is detected. So that basically tells you you have to have some sort of sensor. Okay, so ASHRAE 90.1 is very similar. The, the two codes or the two standards have the same goals in mind, they, there are little intricate details that differ, so I'll go through this a little bit more quickly. Um, first of all, the section that's relevant is 9.4 in ASHRAE 90.1, and what I'm talking about is the 2016 version. Um, all of the codes are, or standards are released on a three-year cycle, so 2016 <coughs> is the latest version of, version of ASHRAE that we have. Um, it's not adopted yet in most places, we're usually, we usually lag a little bit. Um, I think like most recently I've been encountering some jurisdictions that are using ASHRAE 2013, but a lot of them are on 2010. Um, okay. Wow. So the big difference here is that they include a requirement to turn the lighting off based on daylight, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, we don't want to be running artificial lights when it's broad daylight outside. So that's something that's very easy to comply with. Um, and then again, they have prescribed wattages that they allow, also based on lighting zones, and then they have exclusions that are very similar to ICC. So a of, what we've run into a lot of the controls <clears throat> for the exterior lighting, these are all new. So we've had some clients that have parking lots or other areas that they're used to just turning the lights on, mm -hmm. leaving them on and from dust, to, you know, until sun comes up. Right. <clears throat> and they're not used to either bringing the lights down or turning them off after a certain time. Yep. So that's an adjustment that, that they've had to learn mm -hmm. to do um, with that lighting controls. Yep. And it is just a reduction that's required. So we're talking about 30%. Um, let me go back. Um, so if you have a well-lit parking lot, let's say, um, and you reduce it by 30% and you've designed it well and you have very uniform lighting and there's not dark spots and corners, 30% isn't really going to feel that different. Um, so that's something that I try to stress when we get a little bit of pushback. Um, cause it isn't, it's a new concept for a lot of facilities and, and maintenance personnel. Um, do you do this with smart bulbs? I mean, I can dial my light bulbs at home mm -hmm. down. There are a variety of ways you can do it. Um, a lot of times, you can do it on a fixture by fixture basis, and it's it's not a smart bulb per se because there's a whole bunch of LED diodes in one fixture typically. But there will be a sensor, you, or one way to do it is to incorporate a sensor into the fixture itself. And then that sensor will either communicate with other ones wirelessly, and they can kind of work as a, a net, like a, a mesh network, or it can control that one fixture by itself, and then every fixture needs a sensor, which sounds like a lot, but it's really, it's a minimal upcharge, and it's just something that they install at the factory. Um, so they can be controlled that way, or you can install like a centralized system in an adjacent building. So if you've got a parking lot at like a hospital or something, you'll probably have a lot of different lighting controls inside the building. You can put a relay panel in 
that's going to control your exterior lighting as well, and then it'll control it more holistically. Mm -hmm. So like you maybe have one photo sensor, and then you would have occupancy sensors as needed outside, but that one photo sensor would send a signal back to your centralized panel, and then it would say, okay, all of the fixtures do this now. So it's, it's, you can kind of either do it centralized or standalone, and either one works. Is solar measured in the same way um, through as it is through the wiring? Beg your pardon, is what measured? Solar power, solar power measured in the same way when people have their lights on solar power? Um, no, that is not, that's not actually specifically addressed by the code, but you wouldn't be, the, what the code says is that this is related to lighting that is fed from a, a power source, yeah, in from a building, um, or you know, from a panel or the grid, essentially. Um, so, if you're providing solar power to your fixtures, none of this, well, none of the the power consumption issues would apply because you're not you're not actually using electricity that anybody is paying for or is being supplied by a utility. But you're still creating the light. Yes. In the, so, in the atmosphere. Correct. And you would still have to, depending on what's adopted in the jurisdiction, you would still have to comply with any light level requirements or, yeah, light directionality, that type of thing. So it's, that's a little bit of a gray area and not actually something we've run into before, but that's, I think, how it would be handled. Thank you. Sure. Okay, let me get back. Oops, sorry. Okay, so ASHRAE has their similar diagram of the lighting zones. The only difference here is that, let's see, right here, um, they talk about zone <coughs> zero, which is instead of zone one, it's going even more rural. So this is the not occupied, not occupied parts of national parks and places like that. So basically where you would need no lighting at all. Again, ASHRAE has their own table about how many watts you get for a linear foot or per square foot. And they have similar requirements um, for controls. However, they do, the, the big difference here is that they require you to shut off the fixtures overnight. So, and this, you know, we may see this become part of IECC in the next uh, issuance of the code as well, the next code update. But they're saying from midnight to 6 a.m. you need to turn your lights off entirely. So that's a little bit of a harder pill to swallow for some people in some facilities. Um, and then they have the same thing. If your building's open after midnight, you can only keep your lights on an hour after it closes. And then you can turn them on an hour before it opens. Um, or they do allow the authority having jurisdiction to establish their own times that they allow. So it could be overridden that way. Um, and then signage, oh, sorry, I, let me go back. That, I should clarify, this is actually important. So this is just for building facade and landscape lighting. So it's not, if you have a parking lot, that doesn't apply. So that's important, I should have kind of emphasized that at the beginning. Um, but it, we're talking about area lighting, so that would be like parking lots and things like that. You have to reduce it by 50%. So by comparison, IECC was 30%. ASHRAE's upping the ante and saying, okay, well, we want to cut it in half. But it's basically the exact same uh, qualifications. And then they've added one more little um, requirement here that parking lot lights that are above 78 watts but lower than 24 feet in height have to be controlled in groups of 1,500 watts or less, and then they need to be reduced by 50% when you don't have occupancy for 15 minutes. So these are the kind of things that you can really get mixed up with when you're laying something out and designing a control system, but it's really the, you just, the important thing to keep in mind is that the goal is to reduce unnecessary lighting and to reduce it whenever possible. And generally that's 
overnight when nobody's going to be using the facility and when there's enough daylight and then also when there's not occupancy. So those are kind of the main things to take away here. Okay, so um, I mentioned the IES. This is the handbook. This covers all sorts of things. Um, they break it into three sections, framework, applications, and design. So we can refer to this book for you know, prescribed light levels for all different types of spaces, interior and exterior. And then this is the list of um, all the relevant exterior lighting supplements that they produce as well. So like if you're doing a project with street lighting, you know, you might want to look at um, this DG2115 on the left that's bolded. So that's design guide for residential street lighting. So they have some more specific documents that give um, de uh, direction on, you know, or in more detail on specific topics. It's always a little confusing because first we're talking about energy codes, which talk about mm -hmm. how much power you're using. Mm -hmm. You're trying to reduce your carbon footprint, the amount of energy that you're using, the controls for that, and then IES, with the, which is more the light levels and the light quality. Yes. yes. <clears throat> and then we move into more of the light pollution and light, which is a different area. Mm -hmm. So different areas of lighting. How is how is, <clears throat> the, how is crime? as it relates to uh, lighting levels being diminished? So that's a hot topic, for sure. Sure. Um, the, you're going to find differing opinions. Um, the IES, even within it, has higher light level recommendations for areas that are deemed... Um, Questionable. Yeah, right. They... You know, like if it's a college campus or if it's somewhere where there has been known high crime levels in the past, they provide alternate higher light levels for those types of situations. Mm -hmm. When you start looking into the materials published by the um, International Dark Sky Association, they're going to start citing studies that say, oh, well, you know, in 2011 in London, there was an exhaustive study done about reducing the light levels of street lighting and turning them off altogether and crime was unaffected. Crime and uh, I think traffic collisions were supposedly unaffected. I think there's another study in the US, I think by the AMA, American Medical Association, that came to the same conclusion. Hmm. But this is, it's definitely not intuitive. It's, it's not the perception that people have. So you know, as a designer myself, I continue to advocate for lighting that promotes safety. I think it's something that is going to be studied more in the coming years and will probably have an evolution of how we approach it, but that's where I stand on it now. Does that mm -hmm. help? Okay. So here's just an image of some of the additional publications from the IES. Um, and then one other um, body that might play into your um, exterior lighting could be LEED. So is everybody familiar with LEED? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and they have a credit. This is from LEED version 4, which is the newest version of LEED. They have a credit called Light Pollution Reduction. Um, and that's really the only credit that's going to come into play. There's obviously others that relate to energy consumption for a project, but this is what really targets um, exterior lighting. And they're going to talk about how much power you can use, and they're also going to talk about where your light can go. So they're going to say, you know, at the building boundary, you need, to, you need to have this much light, and 10 feet beyond it, you need to have zero. Um, and they're going to require minimal uplight, so it's a very low percentage of your total pr lighting for your project that could be directed up upwards. Um, that's how they deal with that. Um, and then, you know, there's, you can get into more details about signage and things like that, but the general concept is that we want to reduce uplighting and that we want to reduce wattage. And, you know, even projects that don't pursue LEED certification, um, this is still a good reference for what they recommend. We see a lot of clients do that, I would say, Brian, right? That mm -hmm. maybe, if, even if it, they're not pursuing LEED, right. they look to LEED for 
and best the design practices. guides, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, is another mm -hmm. um, advocacy group, as we mentioned earlier. Um, their website is here, darksky.org. There's tons of information there. Um, it's, it's easy to get kind of lost, but I wanted to just kind of introduce the group. Um, so they're, as I mentioned, they're trying to preserve the night sky. So they're looking to work with communities and um, basically have them enact laws that promote dark, you know, darkness at night that improve ecological outcomes that are, you know, healthier for all of us, that sort of thing. Um, it was founded in 1988, and they've been actually building like a pretty big portfolio of cities and parks and um, municipalities that are uh, on board and have actually implemented ordinances that are compliant over the years. Do, um, do municipalities get certified by them? They can, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've included at the end of the presentation a few nearby. There's actually two. Um, Homer Glen is one, mm -hmm. and then Beverly Shores, Indiana is one. Mm -hmm. And then just recently, there was a park in, in Champaign County. I don't remember the name of the park off the top of my head, but it's in here, that became, um, I don't, can't remember what they call it, but it's an International Dark Sky like mm -hmm. Association Park. Um, so. You know, if you're interested in a field trip or something, there are a couple places <laughs> around. Um, and also, the, the IDA worked with the IES to produce this model lighting ordinance that we touched on at the beginning. So they, they are working together, although, as I mentioned, there will be some discrepancies between the two where, you know, like even with the security lighting, IES recommends something that doesn't necessarily gel with the model lighting ordinance. Mm -hmm. But again, the IES is only making recommendations, and that's the same thing that the IDA is doing, so. Okay, so as far as controls go, we already talked about a little bit of this. Um, time clocks, there, as I mentioned, there are a couple types. Astronomic is gonna, it's gonna know what time of day it is. It's gonna take into account daylight savings time. All of that stuff is gonna be programmed into it, and it's typically gonna have battery backup so that you know, even if you lose power, it's gonna pick back up right where it left off. And it's also, you can get like seven day, you can get one year, so you can program holidays and things like that into it too. Um, there's analog timers, so the image on the left is, you know, you just set it and it's gonna say, okay, every night at 6 p.m. I'm gonna turn on, and every night at 2 a.m. I'm gonna turn off. Doesn't matter if it's daylight savings or, you know, so there's a little more work involved. It's cheaper, but you need to make sure that in the summer you're saying, okay, I want to turn on at eight instead of six or whatever it may be. Um, we talked about relay panels. So you can have, that's a, that's a relatively simple control system. You, you can have a centralized panel in a building or you can have one, you know, just freestanding on a site somewhere if you don't have an adjacent building. But that basically is going to send signals to different circuits to tell them when to turn on and off. And it's going to have all the brains, including the time clock, inside it. Um, you can also theoretically put, you know, you could even mount that to a light pole or something if it was really remote, but you still wanted that level of control. Um, occupancy sensors, they're going to turn lights on and off automatically. You call it a vacancy sensor, though, when it's just going to turn lights off um, and they're manual on. So that's not something we really see in exterior lighting, but you, you may hear it. Um, that's something that's pretty common interior, but it doesn't really make sense outside because nobody's going up and turning on the parking lot poles themselves. I think that was a, it was only a couple years ago when I started seeing that in parking lots because <clears throat> people are, are used to occupancy sensors inside buildings, mm -hmm. but they haven't quite gotten used to them outside right. and walking along and having street lights turn on. Yep. And you can mitigate that feeling. Like, you know, sometimes you're at Walmart and you're like walking down the aisle and like, the freezer case is turning on as you go down the aisle. And you can, you can do it differently than that. I mean, you can set it up so that, okay, if any sensor in this entire aisle picks up a person, they all turn on at the same time. 
which feels a little bit better when you're experiencing it. So like that's something to think about. Um, there's, you know, there's good applications and bad applications of everything, but it's, you get a little more energy savings one way and. You're standing there and you see it from a distance point towards you. Yeah, that, that just feels weird. It's very funny. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, good and bad ways to do it. And it's a toss up. You get more energy savings with one, but you get more comfort and people feel better about the functionality of the other, so. Depends what's important. Um, and then these sensors, typically if you're gonna use sensors outside, occupancy sensors, you just have them integrated into the fixture. That's, that's a standard option for most outdoor fixtures. So they'll just come like that from the factory. Um, and then if you're doing a more complex system, like a network system that this image is showing, where mm -hmm. you've got, you know, a sensor on this pole and a sensor on this pole and they're all talking to each other with this little Wi-Fi signal. Um, that's something that needs to be looked at more holistically, but manufacturers and designers are really good at, you know, figuring out how that system's gonna work. And there are a lot of advantages to that, especially if you're talking about a large scale application. Um, photocells, I think we're, we're gonna beat this to death, but they turn the lights on and off based on the ambient light level. So it's, in my opinion, it's really good to have both occupancy and photo sensing, and even before that was a code requirement. Um, the advantage there is that like, if you have a freak thunderstorm at two o'clock on a summer day, it can get really dark and you need your lights to come on, but if you don't have a photo cell, they're not gonna come on. So it's good to always have the photo cell. Um, again, they can be integrated into the fixtures or a lot of times what you'll do is if you've got a parking lot next to a building, you'll just put a photo cell like on the roof of the building and that'll go back to your relay panel and that'll tell every type of site lighting around the building what to do. So you don't have to buy as many sensors and if one malfunctions, you only replace the one. So if you can do that, I think that's a good way to go. This is just a little bit deeper look at this kind of networked system that can be used more like on a city-wide scale. Um, this is something that we're hearing more and more about, um, this wireless communication between sensors that are integrated into fixtures. And it's, it's kind of this whole internet of things conversation that it's, it's infiltrating our lives everywhere. So it's, it's infiltrating lighting as well. And it's, it's cool because the potential is to harvest a lot of data and tell you like what's going on in your community, what areas are people using, um, what areas aren't they using, you know, where, how are they moving through spaces, that type of thing. Um, and then having these kind of smart sensors and remote access to them through the internet is gonna allow you also to get um, like alerts for failures or like imminent failures if you've got batteries that are need to be replaced you know in the next year or something you'll get alerts about that um, and those can all be controlled by whoever the maintenance person is from a desktop computer or a laptop or their phone or whatever it is some internet connected device Do we wherever have anything internet connected here as far as street lighting goes uh -huh. I don't believe or, so or even this building I would not think so. Mike? No. no. Okay. Just curious. It's kind of a new thing. So we, we just did it in our office when we moved um, like two years ago now, and we were testing it out. I think the city of Chicago is also testing this out in pockets because it's really new and there are security concerns because, mm -hmm. you know, For sure. you don't want to be creating more... Um, doorways for people who are up to no good to access a system. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of concerns, definitely, but there's also a lot of potential. So it's gonna be something that we see more and more about. Um, and it might be, you know, in a few years, um, actually very prevalent. So I think it's something to at least start getting informed about. Um, okay, so outdoor lighting types. Um, we talked about HID. Usually that's gonna be metal halide. Um, there, there are some definite disadvantages. So it's always gonna be, of these three types, your highest wattage. It's really common though. It does a pretty good job at color rendering. Um, 
it lasts pretty well, so like 15 to 20,000 hours. That's pretty good, um, better than fluorescent. You, you know, your fixture is going to have a lamp in it that you can remove and replace, so your fixture can last you know, however long the elements will allow it to. Um, one of the biggest disadvantages, though, is if you lose power, um, metal halide lamps don't start right back up. So, like, you'll see this in gyms a lot. They, a lot of times, places mm -hmm. with high ceilings have that. And if the lights go out, it takes, like, five minutes for them to come back on at full brightness. Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to use this thing called quartz restrike that's going to bring them back on quicker. And it's just more money, and it's something to maintain. And so that's a disadvantage. Um, fluorescent lighting is typically going to be the tube style or the CFLs that we're all familiar with. Um, <clears throat> A disadvantage of fluorescent for outdoor lighting is it can be finicky in cold weather. So that's something if you get, you know, bad lamps, they might not come on if it's, you know, 10 below zero, which it very well could be. So that's an issue. Um, again, they contain mercury, so you want to make sure that they're disposed of properly. It's not necessarily a good environmental choice. Um, they still have the ability to change the lamps, so that could prolong your fixture life. Um, the wattage is lower, typically, than HID. So they are, they do provide some energy savings. Um, and they last about 15,000 hours. LED is more efficient um, in cooler weather. So that's a big advantage there. Um, LEDs, the hotter they get, the worse they perform. So they like it when it's cold outside. Um, the, the challenge that I think we don't know how it's going to work out right now is that so many manufacturers are producing LED fixtures right now, and they're changing them, and they're evolving constantly. So when you put in an installation, and the manufacturer says, oh, we're going to stock these LED boards, and you can replace them for the next 20 years, I don't know if it's going to happen. You know, I mean, it depends on how many they put in their back stock, and how many get used, and if yours last 20 years, and they don't have any more. A track tape issue. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of more like your PC, five, a five-year-old PC, and you go to look for parts for it, and they're like, nobody carries that nobody anymore. Cares. Right, you just can't get it. Or your cell phone. Or the phone. Gone in two years. And then there's the other issue, right, with the LED lights in the city of Chicago. They were saying that they didn't get warm enough, so therefore the stop lights were still coated with snow. Oh, that, yeah. And it's been a big problem for mm -hmm. the snowstorm. Yep. That happened here yesterday. Oh, probably. And, and like first hacking up. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 This, this was a bad storm for that, but it was a perfect example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything facing melt. north was coated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all of the rain and slush it beforehand. Just, yeah. Everything was wet and primed to freeze. So that is an issue. LEDs inherently um, reject their heat differently than the other lamp types. They get hot the lamp surfaces get hot, whereas LEDs have a heat sink that sends heat usually out the back. Hmm. So the diode isn't really warm. So that's what happens. Um, I don't have a solution for that. Uh, you know, right. <laughs> but there are definitely applications where that wouldn't matter nearly as much as a stoplight and wouldn't be as big a concern. Um, LEDs are, are by far and away the lowest wattage. Sometimes they'll be comparable to fluorescent, but I feel comfortable saying always lower. They might just not be drastically lower. Um, but their, their lifespan is so much longer that it's kind of a no-brainer. So whereas you know an HID or a fluorescent fixture might be 15,000 hours, they're going to last 50,000, 70,000. And that's actually only to the point where they're fading to like 70%. So the big difference is the other two types of lamps fail right away. So if you, you know, your light burns out at home, it's done. LEDs just gradually fade and get dimmer over time. So they measure it in terms of this L70 number, which is the amount of hours it takes to get to 70% output. Hmm. So if you're looking at a fixture, that's what that means. I haven't gotten there. Um, now I just have some examples. So we don't have to go into all of this, but there's, this is an example of an auto dealership that replaced their HID lighting with LED. Um, they saved 85,000 watts. It looks better. You can tell the color rendering is improved. 
it's typically more even, um, and the energy savings is incredible. So that's that's very common when you switch um, from you know a, an HID source or even a high pressure sodium source or fluorescent for exterior lighting. That's the kind of result that we so see a lot. It's an energy savings, but it's way more light. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, I like the one on the left better. Well, th and that <laughs> that is a design choice, I think, for this particular project because this is a car dealership. They right. like to light those up like crazy. But you could you could absolutely select lower output fixtures that would give you even more energy savings. Hmm. I think part of the difference too is the color temperature. Um, it looks maybe a little bit cooler. Yeah. On the right. Beg your pardon. On the right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we'll talk about in a little bit, but the, the International Dark Sky Association is really trying to steer people away from that. They want to keep lighting warmer because that's more natural and the, the effects of blue light we think aren't good and I think we're probably going to find out that that's right. So that's a very good point about the photo on the right, but the, the energy savings um, is outstanding and you could definitely select LED fixtures that give you the energy savings also have lower levels and are warmer in color so they offer I mean this these are design choices that were made for this project mm. but it could be done differently um, so here's another example very similar um, this was a high pressure sodium lot on the left that you know, we've all seen that, um, the really orange light. Mm -hmm. That makes it a little more difficult at night to actually perceive what you're seeing as well. So there is, this is just an example of how color rendering can play into your feeling of security. Yeah, and I think it's important too, <clears throat> as you talk about cutoffs in dark sky, we were talking about the fire station, which we were involved in updating is that if you look at the, the light sources, they look very small on the building. Mm -hmm. They're above the fire station, it's very dark. But if you actually look at the pavement, because of the efficiency of the fixtures and how they direct the light down to mm -hmm. the pavement, the pavement actually looks very well lit, yep. which is what we were going for with the fire station as they train outside or do demonstrations outside, but that you're controlling what's above it the mm -hmm. light pollution above it. Yep. So there, there's trade-offs there, and what sometimes you might look at the at the ground and go, well, that's a lot brighter. Mm -hmm. It might not be from a light pollution or an energy consumption standpoint. And oftentimes, even the measured light levels will be lower, but because it's more uniform and the light, the temperature of the light is different, it looks brighter to us. So that's something, I've, I've looked at a lot of these, and you know, it'll say 1.5 foot candles on the left, 0.9 on the right, and I'm like, there's no way. But if you get out and measure it, it's actually, that, that can happen. Okay, so exactly what Brian was talking about. Um, light pollution is what we're trying to avoid all the time. So light pollution, this is how the um, IDA defines it, the inappropriate or excessive use of artificial light. And that's comprised of glare, which we all know what glare is. It's kind of hard to quantify it, but you, you know when you feel glare. Um, sky glow, which is, you know, when we look up and the sky looks orange because there's so many lights on in the city. Um, light clutter, which is when you've just got a whole bunch of light sources. So, like, think about coming down a highway or something. Like, there's so many sources that it's just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then light trespass. And all light trespass is, it's a, it's a component of light pollution, but it's just when light gets where it's not supposed to be. So... One of the probably biggest offenders of light trespass is lights being left on in buildings overnight. So it's spilling out the windows and nobody's using it. It's, it's a waste of energy and it definitely contributes to light pollution. So um, typically you're trying to light your property or mm -hmm. your zone yep. and not have light spill off into the neighboring properties. Yep. And that's what LEED thinks is really important too. So that's one of the biggest aspects of the LEED light pollution credit. Um, is making sure that at your site boundary, however that's defined, you're not, your, your light levels are dropping off and you're not going beyond them more than like 10 feet. So hmm. it's, and sometimes that's very challenging depending on where your site boundary is, but there are, you know, manufacturers provide things like shielding on certain sides of fixtures or they, you know, with LED, it's very directional so they can 
get very controlled cutoffs, and that's something that just needs to be planned out in advance. We've had that happen a lot at, between commercial businesses and roadways. Oh, uh, yeah. Because we don't want to spill out into IDOT or the, yep. the local roadway. And if you go to the Target store mm -hmm. and you look at the fixtures closest to the road, you'll see that they installed shields on the fixtures mm -hmm. to not spill out into the roadway. Yep. Sometimes that can be a little bit of a disadvantage because you have bright light on the parking lot up to the property line and then suddenly the bike path or the sidewalk is on the public property and it's not being lit. Right. Do you ever recommend some trespass in order to make a more gradual transition? Yeah, that's sure. actually that's a really good point. Um, one of the probably, I would say most dangerous, I don't need to sound dramatic about this, but one of the most dangerous um, lighting issues is uh, an extreme change in brightness mm -hmm. so like you see that even when you go into a parking garage in your car usually like during the day when you enter a dark garage they'll really light up the entrance <clears throat> so that your eyes have a minute to adjust mm -hmm. um, so that's a yes if you're transitioning on a pathway from a very well lit area to a much darker area and you know a darker area is fine it is very good to implement a gradual transition in the light level so that your eyes have time to adjust and then in the darker area you can still see. So that, that can get hairy though when, depending on who the owners of the different areas are. So that's maybe, I haven't been to the location you're talking about. Yeah, but the, 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 the target issue. store was a lead silver. Okay. So they probably looked, the engineers or the lighting designers probably looked at the property boundary between mm -hmm. public and private and said, lead says we have to cut off. Right. So that's something where like you may have to petition lead or do a variance with lead or something like that, which they may or may not grant. Right. So that's probably what happened. Okay, thank you. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Frozen? I don't know. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, okay. Couple more examples. Um, the diagram on the left is just kind of defining what these different light areas are. Mm -hmm. So the light, the darkest yellow light that you see, that's what you want. That's the useful light. The glare zones are the lower level light that's uh, hitting that guy in the eye. So we all know how that feels. And then <laughs> the upward directed light is just completely useless. Um, so that's just affecting the sky glow and you can also see that light uh, going into the second and third floor of that house which I can speak from experience I have a street light right outside my bedroom window and it's very aggravating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and then this image on the right um, was taken during a blackout in the northeast in 2003 so it just shows you like what the actual sky looks like versus what it looks like on a typical evening. So, I mean, I, you know, in my life have only probably seen stars like that twice, maybe. And once was in Sedona where there are no lights. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people don't think about because it's second nature. It's just how everything is. And wow. um, so that's why the IDA is trying to bring attention to this issue. I think everybody's seen a map like this, just shows where the biggest light pollution areas are in the world. Can we zoom in? There's our light pollution dot. And then this image on the right is kind of cool. It's, it's an, um, you know, it's an artistic representation of what Chicago might look like without all of the light pollution. So just food for thought. Again, more, more sources of light pollution, tree uplighting, which you know, we definitely use on projects, but you try to, you try to do checks and balances. And <clears throat> like, like LEED suggests, you know, if you've got this many watts on a project, only this many of them can be directed up or this many lumens. So if you're going to do something decorative like that, you know, it's at, at the very least, it's best to make sure that everything else you've implemented is um, you know, taking 
taking the dark sky principles into consideration. Same with signage, and especially as we see more and more electronic signs and billboards, this is becoming more of an issue. Mm -hmm. Traditional billboards are still lit, um, but it's not producing as much light as the electronic signs are. And then, you know, why is all of this important? Um, so this is, this information is taken directly from uh, the IDA website, but the reason, I mean, basically, we're talking about using energy we don't need, to, don't need to be using. We're talking about negative impacts on ecosystems, negative impacts on our own health, um, and then, like we talked about, the effects on crime and safety. So their opinion on that may differ from other people's opinion, um, but it is something that they do talk about in depth. And then there's just a, a color temperature chart that corresponds to what we talked about. Um, so as far as goals for communities are concerned, you know, like why is any of that important? Um, safety, lighting promotes a feeling of safety. Um, you need some vertical illumination if you're gonna be able to recognize people's faces from a distance in the dark. Um, a lot of times security cameras have a light level requirement as well, so that's something to think about. Um, but then this last bullet point is what I mentioned. There are studies saying that actually crime may not be as affected as we think by the light levels, but that doesn't change the fact that it does make you feel safer. So those are things that I think will play out a little bit more in the coming years and we may um, have a new approach to that. Um, and then ecological stewardship. Um, nocturnal animals are definitely affected by overlighting um, cities at night. So they're, you know, they're drawn to places with light. So typically they're apparently mapping their routes based on starlight and moonlight. And if a city is radiating all this light, they may be drawn there instead. And then you've got like birds colliding into buildings and things like that happening. Um, coastal wildlife is definitely affected. We've all seen the baby sea turtles that are misled by the light. Um, so that's very sad. And then our own circadian rhythms. This is something we've been looking into at work a lot um, for interior and exterior applications. There's a lot of conversation going on now about how is all of this light affecting us? You know, everybody's phone has the nighttime setting where it starts producing more yellow light and it's dimmer after a certain time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's kind of a result of this conversation. Um, but it's, there's a lot of research left to be done. So some people say it's just the color temperature. The bluer the light, the worse it is for you. Some, some people say, well, it's actually the bandwidth, a, cer a certain bandwidth of light, so it's the wavelength that has the effect on you. Um, but the bottom line is that your body's not gonna produce melatonin the way that it should, and it, it helps you, or it prevents you really from regulating your schedule as your body would naturally. Um, and then energy savings. So the IDA is estimating that we're just throwing 30% of our light into the sky, so we're just right off the top throwing away 30%. And they equate that to about $3.3 billion a year. Hmm. Um, so if you were to implement the recommendations of the model lighting ordinance, their estimate is that there would be about a 60 to 70% savings in energy consumption, which would mean billions of dollars, and then also a huge impact on the carbon footprint of lighting. Hmm. So um, lighting types. Uh, the, the image on the right shows a lot of different fixture styles that are compliant with dark sky. So basically, you just don't want light going up. You want it directed at the area that needs to be lit, and all of those fixtures um, are able to do that. Mm -hmm. And then there are other, we, we touched on this, but their other requirement is that 3000 Kelvin is the coolest light you would use in an exterior application. And that's actually pretty warm. So here's some examples of fixtures that actually have this IDA seal that are dark sky approved. Um, and their website has a, a pretty exhaustive list of manufacturers with links to all of these. Um, but there's, 
It's not like if you want to be dark sky compliant, you don't have good design choices or anything like that. There's a lot of fixtures out there, um, so they can really fit into many different types of sites. Um, okay, so the model lighting ordinance, I've mentioned it a bunch. Um, it's just, it was language developed by the IDA in conjunction with the IES back in 2011, and the whole point was just to take take the legwork out of this for municipalities. So they wanted to put something together that you could just take, you could cut out parts if you didn't want, you could make modifications, but you'd have a framework to work with. And then it could be implemented. The goal being less glare, less light trespass, and less sky glow. And that is available online. Um, you'll have the presentation, but the link is in there. Mm -hmm. I've included all the relevant parts. We are not going to go through all of these unless you want to, but I think the meat of the information is included here, so I thought this could just be a reference guide if, if anybody wants to look back at it. So again, the lighting zones, zero through four, they tell you how you should be lighting those zones. They determine the types of controls that should be used, and you'll find that if you read through these controls. This, this was written in 2011, but a lot of the codes since then, ASHRAE and ICC, have started to implement some of these ideas. And then, you know, the influence of like Title 24 in California also <clears throat> has come into the codes. So the codes are getting a lot better at um, approaching these, these uh, prescriptive requirements that used to be seen as a little bit more drastic or, you know, out there. They're, today, they're actually pretty standard. Um, they also have a section about how to handle existing lighting. So this, I think, is something that's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing a renovation or someone in a city or town is doing a renovation, how significant does that renovation have to be before they have to comply? So they do address that, which I think is helpful. And then they've got all sorts of tables telling you, you know, here are all the light levels that you can have. They've got this... Um, this is from the handbook, which is what I linked to, um, that accompanies the model lighting ordinance, but this deter or just illustrates um, what your backlight, uplight, and glare actually mean from coming from a fixture, and that's referred to as the bug rating. So you'll hear that a lot too. What's the bug rating? Um, and uplight is usually the most important. Backlight is pretty important too. Glare is important, but it's a little bit harder to measure. So the, that's, I, I tend to take that with a grain of salt, what the glare rating is of a fixture. And then they have an optional section at the end for street lighting. So that can be included or not. So this is what I mentioned um, about Homer Glenn and Beverly Shores. Um, Dark Sky does or the, the IDA does have a listing of dark sky places. Um, and Beverly Shores and Homer Glen are called International Dark Sky Communities. Um, and then, so this is Homer Glen. This is Beverly Shores. Middle Forest River. Uh, Middle Four, it's Middle Fork, I think, River Forest Preserve. Um, is a, an international dark sky park. So they have a variety of different certifications. These are the only two types we have nearby, um, but there are a few more on the website that are you know, located um, throughout the world. And that's it. <laughs> so that was a lot of talking. I apologize if I went into more detail about some topics, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer whatever. No, it was very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, I, I think I did more background than was maybe uh -uh. needed, but That's good. at least you have all of this in one place. And there's a, I'll send Brian the PowerPoint in a PDF format with all of my notes, because all of the notes have the sources for a lot of the slides on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So the links will be included if you're looking one for One link that you said was kind of a model that would help a community kind of get started. Yep, yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that one is right here in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right here. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think our goal first was to have this, this kind of presentation where we can get familiar with the terms, 
what are, what's happening out there in the industry, the difference between the energy, the lighting levels, and light pollution, and then for us to be able to start to study that model lighting ordinance. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, as Katie mentioned, that's just a framework. We, we can take that, we can rip yeah. it apart, we can add sections, delete sections, mm -hmm. but I think as a, the goal, I think what we want to do is to take that model lighting ordinance, spend some time on it, get it to a draft format, and then send this up to the other, to the village board and the architectural board for their comments and thoughts mm -hmm. and, and, and see if we can't get that adopted. I'm hoping by the end of next year. And it's really not very long. So the link I sent you, as I mentioned, is the handbook <coughs> version. So that's got some commentary, mm -hmm. um, which I usually think is helpful to have if, if I'm looking at any sort of code. Um, but it's, it's not gonna be something that's like exhausting to look through. Yeah, and we're fortunate too, we have two lead, we have the school, mm -hmm. which if you look at this, not necessarily the security lighting on the dock, but the, the lighting out in the parking lot, you can see what some, uh, some uh, uh, dark sky compliant lighting, also the lighting in the, in the target parking lot is also lead compliant. So you get a chance to compare that, say, to all the automobile dealerships we have in town or some of our other mm -hmm. uh, uh, areas, um, you can see that. Right. Brian, do you have any idea as far as our residential area, um, how, we're, how we are in relationship to where we should be? I, I haven't had a chance to survey it, but I know that there are some neighbors who are brighter than others in terms of <laughs> what they do. Yeah. <clears throat> there is a residential section in the model lighting ordinance as well that has some prescriptive uh, recommendations. So, you know, I didn't include those in the presentation, just we, it got out of hand here, but they're available and that's <clears throat> something, I don't know how those are implemented, but yeah, well, I think you mentioned something that came up and we used it when we did the sprinkler ordinance too, which was there was a trigger. We didn't, yeah. we would not want to force residents to go and change things, but if they're doing certain renovations of a certain dollar mm -hmm. level, changing a few exterior fixtures is, is peanuts. Right. It's just replacing fixtures with a different type of fixture yep. and or including some controls. Mm -hmm. And the controls for home have gotten really simple. I'm starting to convert my home to a smart home. Mm -hmm. So I'm putting in the automated uh, receptacles, automated lighting controls. It's really not that expensive. No. no I, I've done the light bulbs on the outside of the house, and I'm only using 7% of the light output according to whatever's on my phone. That's shocking when you shocking. start to realize <laughs> just how bright everything really is. Yeah. It's, yeah. But it is a different light. I mean, to be fair, mm -hmm. it's much bluer than right. what had been there. But, um, yeah, it, I, I don't think I could live with it at 100%. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the bulbs are getting so much smarter, too. I was talking with Katie that they've, I'm looking at bulbs now that I can put outside and inside, which not only can you dim them, turn them on and off, and program them. you can change the color temperature. Right. Not the color yeah. and the color temperature. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I could put red and green in. I could have them red and green this <laughs> right. season. Right. For the can. holiday season yeah. and change Do it from off. your phone, too. Yeah. But they have one where they demonstrated it next to your bed mm -hmm. when your alarm goes off. Mm -hmm. It simulates a sunrise oh, in yeah. terms of the oh, color yeah. temperature. <laughs> so. Yeah. That, yeah, that technology's been there for some time, actually. Um, there, what does the current ordinance say about light or light pollution? Anything? Anyone know? <laughs> <laughs> not a whole lot. We, you know, we've adopted the IECC, same as all other communities in Illinois. I would really say that's about it. Mike? Right, yeah, there's, there's nothing else. Nothing on lighting specifically, just the energy requirements in IECC. Mm -hmm. I know when we when we were on the board mm -hmm. and we got uh, requests for variances on uh, <clears throat> things like signs and outdoor lights, we as part of those granting those variances, we did talk about lighting controls, and this was for many years before there was you know turning the signs off, and we talked about can you light the sign from above instead of below? Mm -hmm. How is the backlight doing? Um, and those are things that could be formally adopted. So for just anyone replacing it, right? Yeah. And those, I mean, they're not even restricting, I mean, they're not removing the option to light signage, for instance. Right. You know, it's just, do you light it from a little ledge at the bottom or a little, you know, eave at the top of the sign? Or do you light the entire sign from behind or only the letters? Right, you know? yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for Thank you. coming out. No problem. Okay. And this will help us for our discussion on the next agenda item, too. And you'll yes. send us each uh, the yes. presentation? Yep. yep, we'll do that for you. We're going to need a backup. chicken coop lighting. <coughs> chicken coop lighting? Chicken now you lighting. disrupt their rhythms. <laughs> I've been hearing about the chicken coop discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's next up? Is the safe routes, right? Yeah. Speaking of lighting. Yes. Say I'm very familiar with these um, London studies because we just finished quoting some of them to try to get some assistance from our good friends down in Springfield. So, do we have, uh, do we have better friends in Springfield now? <laughs> uh, I do not comment on such things, uh, Co-Chair Renner. So, um, for a little bit of background, um, we recently, as I said, we recently applied for a, a, a state grant, um, Safe Routes to School, so it's a federal pot of money dedicated for things that, you guessed it, help kids um, get to school safer, um, encourage walking, encourage bicycling, discourage um, single-use vehicles. So we've picked <clears throat> one particular project. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the project itself. Um, John Scopoletti, our good administrative intern, is going to talk about the results of some work done by the school district in this regard. So because um, it's a state requirement that um, every parent in the district had the opportunity to complete a survey about walking and bicycling. Every student in the district um, was tallied up as to how they got to school during a particular week. Um, so some good data there. And then we'll come back to a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of the project. Um, again, kind of an interesting, um, just an interesting report, things we wanted to keep you up to speed on and also dovetails very nicely with our discussion um, tonight. Mm -hmm. So, the project is at the intersection of the North Shore and the, um, the Robert McClory Trail. So as you might be familiar, Robert McClory goes north-south, North Shore goes east-west. And there is this, um, I don't know what exactly you would call it, a wishbone, a you know, double, quadruple, switchback, what have you. But um, because of the railroad tracks, you're really limited in how you're able to cross from the east side of town to the west side of town, as we all know. Um, as a bicyclist, your only way across is to go through here. As a pedestrian, you can walk down the viaduct in, you know, in a very narrow space with a railing. Mm -hmm. um, but most people we find choose to go um, in this area. Now, of course, the, the problem with this is it is um, one of Lake Bluff's more rustic settings, let's say. <laughs> So heavily wooded. <laughs> you can see here very heavily wooded. There's some houses over here. You'd you'd never note them. You know, uh, excuse me. This is Sheridan Road over here. You'd never see it. Um, this is you know the railroad over here. Very very dark. Very very secluded. And that's something we hear about a lot from um, parents of kids who might otherwise be interested in walking to school. You know, walking from the east side to the elementary school, or especially walking from the west side over to the middle school when they're a bit older, a bit more able to um, take care of themselves. We'll need marine li rated lights for the underpass. Yes. Submerged. <laughs> Submerged. No joke. <laughs> That's an un unfortunate thing to think about, actually. <laughs> Very. Um, with that in mind, we'll talk a little bit more about the project in a bit now that I have that to worry about. <laughs> um, John, you want to come talk statistics? There you go. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the intro, Glenn. Um, so I did a little statistical analysis based off the results that we got from the surveys um, that the school uh, received. So it's just a presentation on the uh, parent survey analysis about walking and biking to school for both the uh, elementary and middle school. So just a real quick background, the elementary school uh, deals with uh, pre-kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, the elementary school received 102 responses, um, and the middle school deals with grades uh, from six to eight 
and 63 responses were collected. That's good responses. Mm -hmm. So the first graph you have in front of you, uh, just a quick note. So we did, I went through all the charts and we wanted to keep a little bit of consistency so that way there was no misleading um, statistics between chart to chart. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice for the elementary school, the highest that the graph will go besides one slide is going to be 60. And that's why there's such a gap. We just wanted to keep the consistency. And then along with the middle school, the highest that it will go will be 40. So just a quick note for that. Um, so just looking at this real quick, you can see that the um, most responses fell under uh, the children being one mile to two miles um, away from the elementary and middle school. So they're similar in a way, but that obviously had the most, uh, the greatest amount. And then next would be um, half mile to a mile. In elementary school, there was a greater um, there were more children that were closer um, in regards to the elementary school compared to the middle school. So the next one is in regards to how long does it normally take your child to get to and from school. So the blue is uh, on both charts resembles the travel time to, to school and the green resembles the travel time from school. Um, so similar to kind of how the last slide went, there's really one area that's pretty um, consistent, so the five to, five to ten minute um, uh, distance, I guess, um, is the most populated both to and from uh, school for travel time. And then uh, less than five, very few that live that close. Um, and then the next one would be the 11 to 20 minutes, that's the next largest area. And then an interesting one. Um, that I noticed uh, for the middle school at least, if you look at the more than uh, 20 minutes, it's a more said that for the travel time there than on the way back, which is kind of interesting. It's because the kids walk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but You have to get there in the morning at home. Afternoon, they can take their time. My kids did that all the time. And so this is the next one. Um, so this is in regards to how they are arriving and leaving school. Um, <clears throat> one area that, or at least two areas from both, the elementary school, one area to look at for the green, uh, for the school bus. A lot of students are uh, taking that uh, home from school and that's uh, a lower amount compared to the amount that are arriving at school using the school bus. Um, so the green is leaving and the blue is arriving. Um, and for both elementary and middle school, that's the biggest difference for one category specifically. Um, or actually, no, that's false. That's the most difference. That's the biggest difference for the elementary school. For the middle school, it's very similar. But the greatest difference in the middle school is uh, the family vehicle, vehicle, which you can see is just over 60 for leaving <coughs> from school, but is over 100 for arriving at school. So there's quite a difference for that. Well, the elementary school, it's definitely because of the after school care. <clears throat> That's the difference in arriving and leaving, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of the notes that were um, that was stated mm -hmm. on the survey too. What does most kids, a lot of kids, are saying after school? Yeah, they go from school the school thing. over to the park district. Uh, okay. Ours does, and then we pick her up in the car at at the after school care at the park district. So she takes the bus in the morning, <clears throat> and then we pick her up from car in the afternoon. Yeah, but the family vehicle on the middle school is probably arriving is probably mm -hmm. those kids that did not get up on time, <laughs> right. which I would have been one. Yep. And then uh, just moving forward, very little, no one for transit. Um, skateboarding is, it seems more popular for the elementary school than the middle school. Um, and then a carpool is low for both. And then walking um, for the middle school is a lot greater for uh, departing after after school's over than it is compared to going to school. Mm -hmm. I do want to point Middle out you can Middle school starts at 8:30, right? So they do have time know. to they can sleep a little bit. Yeah. Which is probably a, has a positive impact on walking potential. Right. Yeah, I'm not too sure as to when they start, but yeah, that's yeah, it could be So true. from from my recollection looking at the survey results, one we don't talk about in here is there's a question that says how old will your kid have to be for them to feel comfortable walking to, to school? Right. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. Anecdotally, I, I would 
I'd guess the average for that was about fourth grade. Yeah. So that cuts off most of the elementary school. Yeah. yeah. And the second is, I'm taking a little bit of a leap of faith, but I mean, you can really see the mode shift from family vehicle in the morning, uh -huh. and that basically all goes into walking in the afternoon, if I'm eyeballing that. Yeah. You know, yeah. You have to think that. I think a lot of times you drop your child off on the way to work. Yeah. And then you mm -hmm. know they're there. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah. A lot of people do. All right, so moving along. Um, the next one is, um, would you probably let your child walk or bike to or from school if this problem uh, was changed or improved? So this is set uh, from least to greatest. The reasoning that the uh, last five are all green, <laughs> those are the same category. The next slide will make more sense, but both this, both this chart and the following chart, these five categories are listed as the top five for both. Huh. So that's the reasoning that they're green, um, with the highest being safety of intersection and crossings, next is speed of traffic, and amount of traffic, distance, and then weather and climate. Can we improve the weather and climate, or no? We can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't change your lights and you keep them on all day, it'll get much warmer much quicker, right? <laughs> Touche. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the next one. Um, in this, the top three um, were safety of intersections, crossing, or safety of intersections and crossing, which is the same as the previous one, and then weather, weather or climate, and then speed of traffic. Now, distance, amount of traffic, mm -hmm. and sidewalks are all the same. That's why they're yeah, highlighted. The reasoning that sidewalks or pathways is listed as gray is because that's the only one, like how I stated before, that is not in the top five, hmm. essentially. If you look back at this, it just misses the top five. So uh, essentially those categories are the most consistent um, when looking at the surveys from, that we received. What is the incidence of violence of crime here? I mean, what is that? I, I, that's a perception uh, rather perception than actual me measured I'm, instant I'm, instance. That's, that's a perception that low. there's violence and crime in the community? Yeah. yeah and that's I mean, why they don't send their Or they don't walk. want them on the, on the bike path But perceived. I think was this one where you had to rank them? Yeah. So you had to respond to that. So it's you had to where you say ranked that it. that so was a high reason why you didn't send your child to so school? On, is that no, it's a low. low. On this one, it was actually a, a pick. Yeah, so I don't think this was a rank. Yeah, so this oh. one this one is actually, it was a two-part question. The first part was you identifying what are some areas, what are areas, or what are reasonings as to why you're not allowing your child to walk or bike to school. Then the next one is this, which says, which hmm. essentially says, if um, from the choices that you made in the previous question, if they were improved or changed, would you then allow mm -hmm. your child to walk or bike to and from school? Mm -hmm. So there's that consistency. I've got some comments later on that may oh, come sure. back to this that may make a little sense as to why, but yes, it's based off of perception. I don't, perception. Okay. Yeah, I don't truly know what, where that's coming from. Hopefully it'll be very much less next time the survey is run around. Um, mm -hmm. So then there's how much fun is walking or biking to and from school? So it's very fun according to uh, students both in the elementary school and uh, the uh, middle school along with the parents. Um, so there was only one there's individual one that thought it was boring. So. <laughs> Just walking in the rain. In the we, yeah. we know that one. <laughs> And then the next one is quite similar. How healthy is walking or biking <laughs> to or from school? So obviously um, the parents of these students understand the importance of um, you know, playing outside, getting your uh, fitness, and uh, walking, is definitely, walking and biking is definitely a great way to achieve that, especially for a young child and uh, instilling that at a young, at a young age. <clears throat> so it's great to see it. It's like this, no uh, unhealthy, so that's a start. Um, <laughs> And so here's our comments. So for the elementary school, when looking at the surveys, these were the three that I thought were most beneficial for us, along with what kind of stood out with what we're doing as a committee. 
So the first one would love to see a better crossing by the target for Knollwood kids. Um, mm -hmm. The next one would be a crossing guard at Waukegan and Route 176, which I believe deals with the state. So I guess there's a situation that is a little sticky that we may have to kind of, we need more people to kind of get that going if, if that's what um, resi our parents and students want to do. Um, and the last one is need more lights on walkways and bike paths. So fairly similar to what our previous presentation was about. Um, lastly, the Lake Bluff Middle School need more bike rack space at the school. So we're attacking that and hopefully we'll be able to solve that for them. Mm -hmm. um, the next one was an individual specifically from East Sheridan Road stating there's a, doesn't have a distinct sidewalk making it hard to get to the bike path. Mm -hmm. So an area of interest. And lastly, um, we would love a safe bridge at 176 and Waukegan Road. So just a couple areas that I thought stood out based off the comments. A lot of the other comments that I saw were, you know, we love walking to school. My child loves, you know, being able to walk, bike. Um, that kind of that sense of responsibility at a young age is just, a, you know, the start. Um, I have seen kids try and run across 176 at the target. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, not at the stoplight. Oh, by like, right by like silo or that, that, something. No, the deer, uh, the Dunkin' Donuts. Oh yeah. Oh. Mm. So well, they're, not going, they're not going down to the intersection. Long. No, they're not going down in the intersection. You just go, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. I've seen them cross at the actual target too. The, mm. And even though there's a light there, it's scary. Yes. Okay, yeah, so that's my last slide. Hopefully that was informative. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty solid survey overall. Yeah. And um, it's really cool to see the comments that were made in the survey and what we're doing as a committee. Um, so I think we're on the... I know we're on the right track, so. Great. Do you have any Thank questions? You. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Hmm. What time of year was the survey done? Uh, I, want, I want to say last year in the fall. Okay. I, I believe, don't quote me on that. I can tell you that tomorrow for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, oh, okay. It was just the last few weeks, so okay, um, end of October. Last few weeks. Okay. I did notice that the uh, elementary school, because we've gone past it quite a bit, the, the, during the warm weather, the bike racks right there by the, in the elementary school in the back, um, you know, the forest, forest area there, mm -hmm. is quite full. I mean, mm -hmm. despite them saying that, you know, <clears throat> not a lot of the elementary school kids are using it, they're, they're, they're usually quite packed. So, and other wrong yeah. type of racks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get there. Yes. One step at a time. Yep. Uh, kind of an interesting thing we have, if we get to piggyback off this, is assuming we um, are funded for the grant, we're committed to do the very same thing again um, six months after these are installed and up and running. So probably we would think about this time next year, maybe a little later. So we'll have a nice A B comparison as far as this project and maybe mm -hmm. um, anything else we do along the way. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. Um, so to conclude, before we move on, the actual project itself we didn't talk about, but I'm looking at, I believe, 26 pedestrian scale lights that run here from, this is the middle school right here, um, you cross Sheridan Road, and they take you all the way um, up both sides of the switchback situation, up Macquarie Trail here, then underneath the viaduct, and then they even tease out in the west center here on this um, little addition to the trail. So from here on out, you're not talking about lighting, but you also have better natural light there. You have less foil, foli foliage, especially mm -hmm. to your right, to the north side. Um, and again, we think in this most secluded area, um, try to bring up that perception of security, try to make it a little easier for kids to see the road, especially when there's ice or snow. Um, try to cut back on some of these avoidable injuries and mostly just make it a more attractive um, way to walk, especially given that with the railroad here, this is the only way to walk. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. so was there, I mean, the logical first step to me is getting rid of the buckthorn. I mean, that's a huge problem. That's why it's <coughs> dark. That's why you can't see. I mean, that's, and that's much cheaper. Well, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But that would seem like a sensible first step. Um, 
It's made a big difference, I think, at the high school, Absolutely. being able to see the bike path from a safety perspective. Totally. Aren't they Has that been considered? Out? Um, I thought they were working on that, weren't they? Yeah, they are I've working. I've seen them out there in those, some of those But areas. I don't know that they're no. going beyond says, sort of the yeah. high school. And, uh, no, they did do it in they front did. of the middle school. They've middle done school, it right at the I don't know that anyone owns it whole. to do it. I don't know there's any plan to do the whole Who, thing. Whose land is that? Um, is it a bunch of uh, overlap? It is. So there's um, potentially some Union Pacific land here. Uh, most of this is controlled either by IDOT or Lake County DOT. Yeah. It so, looked like a lot of it had been done between the middle school and when the other day, they were, a lot of it had been. They just out. took There's it. Segments. They just took it between um, the middle school and yeah. maybe yeah. the artesian Sheridan. I mean, but it's not, not so much. Nice. No, no not even that far, Glenn. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, keep going. It's, it's about, right. Yeah. I know our crews right have been working to. Yeah. 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 Our crews have been working to open it up around the crosswalk. Right. Um, yeah. When they've had the time to be able to get out there and do clearance. And it has made a big difference. It, it it's significantly different. It's better. So is this the extent of the, the grant application is where we're proposed, where it's shown right now? Sure, yeah. So this is not um, by any means the final design or the final um, devices, anything like that. But this is just the conceptual level right. of, you know, to if you're going to put in lights, lot. where are they going to go? The only thing I thought about when I saw this... Um, looking at it from biking into the train station and biking into downtown was that if 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 we're applying to this the safe schools transport these boundaries make sense but if this work's going to get done the village may want to consider taking it further north and picking up the loop across the bridge and into the train station with additional lighting into the downtown oh, area yeah because if all the work's going in for conduit and underground and all that stuff for a small leg to be picked up that's not really part of school mm. traffic, although the kids do like to go downtown after school, um, might be worth considering. Which piece do you mean? Um, the piece that goes, yeah, right there. Over the, over oh. the, vi the viaduct. Yeah. And through our really. Is still on the west side? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because isn't it just sort of the bridge right there and then you're right at the train station? Right. Yeah. And that, it clears the, out right there's, the there's one light there. There are only one light, so as you go down, well, through the narrow bridge, which I think is was originally under a grant application, but then got put down. I don't know if it's coming back. The bridge is coming back. Yes. So um, here, uh, we've been in communication with the state about that recently. There was a DNR grant to redo this bridge that I think is um, coming back to life. Great. Knock on wood. So what I'm thinking is, once the, once this goes further on down the line, there may be, say, at that uh, one of those red lights, you may put in a, see if we can put in a, a junction box and a floor box and a connection to allow the village to pick up a circuit and go further north. Yeah, cause especially, I'll, we'll show you here, it's really, and that is a good idea, Brian, there's really a very short length here. You just have to get about here yes. and then you pick mm -hmm. up into yep. right. more of the train yeah, station. Yeah, because it's dark. When, uh, what did we just have some event where somebody got Clipped, right? At there were um, two incidents right around um, Halloween. I don't, yeah. I don't know that either is very representative, but they, they happened here at the this the rat with the flashing beacons between the train station. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one driver was going at a very excessive speed, which says we might have to do some things to the north, perhaps, as people are coming into town. Mm -hmm. And then another one, I believe, involved someone that was incapacitated. So. I don't know if those are great examples necessarily, but um, they certainly underline the importance of how, just how much pedestrian bicyclist traffic, how much goes through this area. Mm -hmm. yeah. true. What would it take to get one of those flashing beacons on the crosswalk to the school, like from Tangley Oaks and that other neighborhood? It's the elementary school? Yeah, over the elementary um, school. Over right. here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I stopped for somebody who was crossing, and somebody came around my left oh, side gosh. and was beeping Brilliant. at me the whole time. And luckily, you know, this kid saw it already and stopped. But Ooh. I thought, you know, it would be nice if I don't know how that works because I know they just not. assumed you'd stop for the fun of it. Yeah, I don't know why you. Yeah, I mean, it was scary. I've never seen that That's before. That's terrible. Yeah. Um, I'll take children. 
no to that too. So I believe, I'm not positive, but I believe north of 176, Green Bay turns back into a state route. So there'd be some coordination involved there. Mm. Um, you know, the actual process of putting in the beacons is not that hard. I don't know how much the ones at the train station cost, but usually it's um, twenty to thirty thousand dollars at the high end. If you don't have okay. like to tap Approval. into, Definitely. yeah, the approval's the bigger hurdle. Yeah, so yeah. I would think that would help the school, crossing guards it would too. Be yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as it is, um, you know, while school, school's in session, there there are the the flashing beacons that we put out in um, in the crosswalk. Usually, there's a guard in that area, right. um, but. It's a good thing to look at. Um, back to the, the lighting proposal, you said they would be pedestrian approved or? or pedestrian. Uh, yeah, pedestrian so scale is the magic number. So or what the does magic that word. mean, if you want to detail that out for the committee? Sure, so it's, um, it's about as simple of a term as it sounds. Instead of going for uh, you know, a very high street light street height, lights. you're just going, yeah. um, I think, neighborhood of 12 to 15 feet above the path. Um, I, I don't know if that's quite the right number, or maybe even a little bit shorter, but you know, not something that's made for a highway, right. essentially. Good. So yeah, you have that's a pole, uh, and then you have just a LED fixture. And what do you know? IDA approved. Wow. Only if they choose 3,000 degree Calvin fixtures if they choose 4,000 it is not <laughs> there you go duly noted so we and then you've got to deal that. with the water that's yeah. another day yeah that one's gonna keep me up a little bit tonight <laughs> <laughs> um but uh what was the other thing, comment i had about this okay so they would also have to look at the lighting controls um mm -hmm. i i don't see after why after midnight we couldn't turn it down 30 percent you know uh, oh, not yeah. off but 30 uh, percent because Hopefully no one at midnight is needing that, but uh, it'd still be lit. It just wouldn't be lit as much. It's just the power density, not the lighting 30%. Yeah. The power density goes down 30%. I mean, do, are they something that have to be on all the time? Could it not be where you show up and then the whole thing is lit up and then turns off? Because it's not like there's going to be a million people. Right. I mean, you there. could put in occupancy sensors like we talked about where it wouldn't right. just turn on one, but maybe it turns on four or five right. uh, and, and again the nice thing about this from the cost standpoint is all those controls are just right in the little bottom see that little hole under the fixture it's just it's a, a 40 50 60 maybe 80 dollar option to say okay out in there i want a photo cell and a timer and a controller in this it's it can be all localized to that mm -hmm. or it can be back in the cabinet because they're going to have to wire these all back to the cabinet what is done in the viaduct under uh under Green Bay. What kind of lighting do we have there and when does that turn off or do we have not have does lighting there? There is lighting there, I believe. I'm not familiar with I'm um, not sure how it's parameters, yeah. I think maybe they could all talk work with Yes. Her. And that was part of the replacement, right? It was part of this, right? Under the viaduct would include these, right? Um, the viaduct over at Green Bay, that would not be included in could here. Could you bring up the path? I'm the, sorry, maybe I missed it. Well, we're talking about two, I guess, so we're... Um, yeah, it's right there. Yeah, Leslie, I believe you're, oh, you're, you're talking about side. out here. Uh, you're talking, talking about this Oh, sorry. I, I was getting confused. I Never don't mind. know what happens there. Is there light in there really? It's quite long and yeah. it's dark. I believe it's lit. It's, yeah. Oh, that's so. different than this one over here, right? right, right. I think there's lights in there. I yeah. think there's a gate we may still close or something like that, but there are the lights in there. Too, there I, yeah, I think there's a light inside there. Yeah. You close it during the night? Wow. No. They do? They don't close it. At one point they did. The oh, gate's still the gate, there. But I've never seen it yes, close. Yeah. Because that I was going to be a potential now, yeah, jump no. zone. Yeah, no. Oh. Does the, has the village closed that? Is that who's responsible in the past when it's been closed? Um, I believe so. I think it was a point of some contention back when the when that was put in. Why would yeah. it be closed? Just safety uh, concerns? I think, it were, I think it was safety concerns. It was almost yes. more dangerous to close <laughs> I think it almost people crashed into, into it. it Way back there. when, there was one or two people who claimed that that was going to be a major crime tunnel. People were just going to be waiting there for you. So now it's lit. That would be good. No, now it's closed. 
No, no. I don't, I don't think, think at one point there was a gate. Closes. Yeah. Um, More they on that. Raised later. up the drawbridge. Yeah. Like night, so. yeah. Um, and the only other thought I had was, and again, just future proofing, if those fixtures go in and there's conduits being run, uh, dug up in the trenches, whether we would want to outfit any of the fixtures with the future communications conduit or future communications need, should we ever want to include video cameras on any of the poles in the future. Mm -hmm. It's cheap now to put in empty conduits and the pole strings and bring them back to a cabinet location. And someone says, oh, it would be really great if we had a couple cameras at the at this point in this point. Mm -hmm. Is it not possible to do these using solar? Just have them off the grid? So I know we, at one point, um, before we looked at this particular pot of money, I know we had been look, working with ComEd on some options for um, some funding assistance um, from a program they have, mm -hmm. and that that subject came up. Um, I'm trying to remember where the we landed on that. The whole rooftop at the fire department. Yeah. That's solar. No, that could be. Look at that space. Oh, should be. Yeah, I'd have to look back into that one. I know it's. I know we have discussed it along the way, but I can't tell you where we landed on it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Just seems like it would be that much better if it were not sucking any power from Lake Worth. Mm -hmm. That we'd be paying there. for. Hmm? Yeah, of wood exactly. in there. That'd be yeah, we'd have to. Mm -hmm. Solar. I'd have to put in solar and batteries. Yeah. A lot of the individual lights I've seen sometimes have their own solar panel on the light fixture and their own battery systems. Right. Uh, but then you're going to add, you know, fifteen hundred dollars per light fixture or more. Mm -hmm. that much? But then it's not sucking. Right. No, no. I'm not opposed to asking the question, yeah. but I think the in that area, because these are pedestrian level, putting solar on the fixtures themselves would probably it's would. It's forced. Would be it would help if we got rid of the buckthorn. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's not there's mutually trees. exclusive options. <laughs> State just won't pay us for that. Trees too. So you almost have to pick a grassy area somewhere, or, somewhere outside. Feet, but I maybe if no you argument. maybe if you can't put uh, <laughs> electricity under the tunnel because of the water issue that we that is there, maybe that's where you do solar. Where marina? Yeah, be, and when you go under the pedestrian viaduct or whatever, hmm. if that if that's been filling, filling. <laughs> I joke, but you can put marine grade fixtures there that will oh, okay. function perfectly That'll well. Fine. No, well then we ought to consider that. Would that would be important. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have a reason to consider that. That would, that would be, yeah. But that looks like there that the Not poles are located the on the other side of the tunnel, go and turn them which <laughs> I don't know if that's enough. Yeah. You may want to put one inside, mm -hmm. tie it to the same controls. But I know this is preliminary. This is not a. Yeah. This is just to get it going. It's the basis of our, of our money ask. So much above and beyond this would be village funds. But um, you know, certainly there's some. It's more like we have money to now, so. Glenn, change this design. What um What are your thoughts on the probability of success with this grant application? I don't know. So it has a lot of unique strengths and perhaps um, a few unique weaknesses. So strengths. Um, we're bottlenecked. This is the route. There's no other real way to get across the tracks. Um, it benefits every school in the district. Um, that's a big stre strength. We have great walking and bicycling as it is, and so this is likely to help a lot of people. Strength. Um, regional importance as well. I mean, these are both regionally designated trails with CMAP. Strength. Um, weaknesses, I would say, um, you know, one, there's already a shared use path, so the, it exists. Um, this is an attractiveness improvement, which matters, but um, depending on how they score these things, you know, it doesn't actually make a new route, mm -hmm. so that could be to our detriment. Hmm. Um, again, depending on their scoring methodology, you know, compared to other communities in the state, we have a high uh, ability to pay, and so compared to, you know, mm -hmm. areas that may not have um, that luxury, that can be a detriment. Um, and then I, I guess the last one I would say is because this is already a separated path, there's no, there's no real accident benefit. 
Um, so you can you know, make some abstract arguments about if we make this more attractive, you'll get kids away from the roads, you'll reduce the chance of a vehicle versus pedestrian incident. Yes. Um, but there will be competing applications that are addressing probably fatality crashes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so hard to know how it'll pan out. I think it's got a good shot. It was certainly worth the application. Have we ever um, tapped this fund before? Safe routes to school funding in particular, I'm not sure. I know at one point the village um, had funding secured, Elon Musk, for, the tunnel. Um, for a tunnel that would go north-south in this area. Oh. And so um, it was awarded. Um, the funding partnerships among the village, the school district, and the park district didn't come together at that time. I think it was... Brian, you were probably at the board at that time, yeah, 2004, 2005. Yeah. yeah, we got a certain amount of money from the grant, and the village had to cough up, the park district and the school board had to cough up, and, and they didn't. only the village board coughed up. Yeah. So it was going to go north-south on the east or west side? West? I, I believe on the west side, because that's where this, um, not really trail, but this wider path comes up through yeah. there. But that would have kept kids completely oh, off the intersection here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that was that would have been a seven figure project. Yeah, it was it was it was costly. So Pretty I don't good. want to minimize the school or the park district because it was a at the time it was a different economy and it was a pricey contribution. So But that is a scare as a parent with kids who ride bikes there, it is a scary intersection you know, every day. Mm -hmm. Please get across. Yeah. What is the, because um, I, I walked that to the train uh, during some of the not pleasant weather, it seems like it's hit or miss with the plowing and the cleaning of those pathways. Uh, maybe it's last on the list of the clearing for the village? I wouldn't say it's last on the list. I mean, we, you know, we get to them the same way as we get to roads and things. Um, you know, if, if memory serves, we have, you know, a little scooter ATV type thing with a right. file that goes through mm -hmm. there. So those lights aren't really going to interfere with that. Right. It was just kind of my general impression that they we could were have. Lacking. Where you could have visited our plowers and whatever could have, that bike path and that whole area into my neighborhood could have been cleaned more frequently. I'm with or you. shoveled more frequently or salted more frequently because I, it's, it, when you're coming down, especially under the viaduct and you're going, it gets slippery and yeah. yeah. I mean, like, that? like that? Like that? Yeah. yeah that's well, worse than that, but yeah. Precisely. Well, especially it's really all the shade. It, it, what people end up doing is they end up, they end up walking on the, <laughs> on the grass. Yeah, heading east, it's really, it gets really slippery as you go into the viaduct. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some near wipeouts there. So anything on a slope and on the north side of yeah uh, that is it just takes a while in the winter yeah um, so more frequent plowing and salt would help it would help if, and it would encourage more use yes too. If, if it didn't seem like it was going to if you were going to wipe out when you were trying to cross <laughs> it you um you might try more okay next topic <laughs> sure. So again, our information report, we'll let you know how this goes. If nothing else, we got some good data along the way. Good. Appreciate good your input. Sense. Just to see if we got yeah. funding. Yep. So award for this will be coming down March, April-ish. So stay tuned. I still say think about Buckthorn. Buckthorn. Get your yeah. clippers out. Take them, take them down there and just, just start clipping. Yeah, you know, didn't they first. didn't they remove Buckthorn further north without having talked to the? Um, there's a um, there's so a private individual that did that mm -hmm. without anybody's authority. North of they had state permits. They had state permits. They had state permits. They didn't have like fluff right knowledge, state. right? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. I'm not encouraging that. Like on the Shorikers, like up there. Uh huh. <clears throat> Crabtree. I still think that they should talk to Lake Bluff at the same time, but um, anyways. Communication, okay. communication, communication. Mm -hmm. So one more subject before we get to work planning and, and some teasers um, for next year. So again, this is one of these sort of happenstance things that happens in the village that we want to bring your attention. Um, a plan you may not be familiar with, we can circulate um, that this group is has on its list of responsibilities is our portion of the Lake County um, All Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan, ANHMP, 
rolls off the tongue, I know. <laughs> oh, it really um, does. So it's, uh, it's a federally required plan. If we were to ever have a disaster, we have to have this in place. Um, it's also you know, prudent. Um, you know, the more that we can uh, make ourselves resilient to these disasters, the less, um, the less damages we experience in the event of a disaster, the more that routine events such as the viaduct flooding, mm -hmm. um, or the less, I should say, those um, affect us day to day. Yeah. Um, so this was in your packet. Yeah. Um, this is a report we give annually to Lake County that summarizes our progress um, towards the goals that we're responsible for in the plan. Um, so some of them are pretty simple. Have you kept complying with watershed development? Yes, we have. Are you still a tree city USA? Yes, we are. Um, and then some of these are some of the bigger things the village has been dealing with in the past year. So a lot, a lot, a lot in here about flood preparedness, about um, flooding, about how to fortify your home against some of these high water incidents we've been getting more and more lately. Um, there's also a bit in here about um, some of our infrastructure work. So we're doing things like smoke testing, we're replacing lift stations, we're trying to get some of this infrastructure more resilient to these events. And then finally, although we, I don't think we've been thinking about it as an emergency preparedness issue in many circles, um, a lot of the discussions around our fire department, having more staff in the station, having more um, facilities at our disposal as some of these other partners in the region have, have moved around, um, we, we think that's had a positive effect on um, our preparedness too. So on the whole, my, uh, we have a, uh, a countywide meeting on this in about, about a month from now, give or take. Um, so I'll report back on how everyone else is doing. I can say looking at our progress in the last few years, this is probably one of the better reports we've turned in, again, because so much attention is being focused on some of these stormwater issues. Um, but we wanted to make sure you were aware of it, and if there were anything to take back, take home with us, we are all ears. The, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, this was great, and just myself, it would have really helped if I had had some kind of a little key from you maybe on the N A N H M P the W the W D O. I had to really get into my computer and try to figure out what it all was and I did apologize but, for that. But it would really help. I just wasn't the aware acronyms of, were I wasn't right. aware of any of Acronym yeah. soup. And, yeah. Uh, it, it would really help. Okay. That was all. I, this was great. I loved yeah, it. I that's good was to great. see. Mm -hmm. Really good to see. Could you remind me what the smoke testing pipe inspection? It's about the sanitary sewer. It's just a survey at this point. Um, essentially, depending on what it is, there might be repairs. So okay. one of the big things at a high level, maybe this is obvious. It wasn't to me when I learned about it. Um, you, you know, even though we bury these things underground, they still are somewhat permeable, they still crack, they can still be exposed to water. And so the biggest reliability issue you have with a sanitary sewer is water comes into the ground, it soaks in or reaches a break in the pipe, water starts getting mixed in with your sewer, it goes in much faster than sewerage, and you, know, you start outrunning your capacity really fast. The EPA really cares about this because you have more water in the pipe than what you can move, mm -hmm. your lift stations or your treatment plants start spilling over, you might recall when there was a power outage down at the beach, we had such an incident this year, kind of a unique incident in that case. But um, So the EPA really cares about this. This is really good from just a prevent damage perspective because oftentimes they'll go back into people's basements, things like that, when these things aren't under control. And the smoke test just gets the smoke comes out, goes in one end and comes out the other if it's working correctly. Bingo. So depending on the circumstances, there's some money if we discovered anything big to do a repair on the spot. Usually that's used. Um, some amount of seepage is normal. So I and I is the term infill and infiltration, inflow and infiltration. Um, so we might plan for those main replacement projects and out years. And then finally, um, we have periodically we do manhole replacements. Mm -hmm. So again, one of the biggest ways water gets into the system is manholes that aren't secure or that are starting to um, the, the structures underneath are starting to collapse or cave in just because they're more complicated structures than you would think, pretty old. Mm -hmm. And so those are used to identify where to prioritize that money as well. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Has there, has there been any update uh, with the, I think it was the Army Corps of Engineers and how we're going to handle uh, the flooding uh, under the 
bridge, under the railroad bridge? Sure. Updates? So there's no update. It's, I don't think there's been any engagement with the Army Corps at this point. Um, there has been talk about funding a second study um, of the viaduct to look for alternative options. Um, so for those of you not familiar, here a few years back, there was a study of why does the viaduct flood, what can you do about it? The easy answer is there's no easy answers. Um, you can spend a couple million on a project that doesn't do a whole lot, or you can start to spend very large amounts of money on very invasive things. So one proposal was to build very large detention basins nearby. A second was um, essentially a, the idea that's been floating around now that maybe would get some study with the Army Corps floating engineers. Floating around? Is, really? <laughs> bad choice of words. Yeah. <laughs> But um, and another idea has been to expand the pipe that goes underneath the viaduct now. Well, that pipe outfalls into a ravine, and so does that just start washing out the ravine. The thinking is you'd have to do um, certain things that are difficult to do regulatorily, if mm -hmm. you would. So one would be move, if you could, move the water from this watershed into the Skokie River watershed. That's usually a no-no. And the second would be create a new outfall to Lake Michigan, also usually a, a no-no. So yeah. um, kind of a big slope in terms of regulation to figure out as well as just the engineering practicality as well as the dollar amount. Willow so, trees and not, and not buckthorn. <laughs> Say that one more Willow trees and not buckthorn. Well, and buckthorn Could exacerbates its flooding, if mm -hmm. everyone knows that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not that commonly understood by residents. Mm -hmm. Another reason. And the last question I had is I noticed that uh, under the building code, you had no plans or no <laughs> changes proposed for changing our building codes. I don't, I, I'm not just, I'm just opening it up and whether we know that in some communities, particularly coastal communities, um, they did not want to change their building codes. They didn't want to adapt to information on increasing flooding and rising seas, and so they kind of ignored and didn't want to force <laughs> things to be built differently. <laughs> so I, I, I know that um, I know that we're better than we used to be, and a lot of the problems in some parts of the community <clears throat> were, you know, 50, 60 years ago, you built to a 40-year flood. And then they built a 100-year flood, and now we're, we're building better, but I'm just kind of asking the question, are there are things we can do from a building code standpoint for new structures, new houses, new roads that would, that would improve the resiliency of our, of our town or parts of our town to withstand, say, floods uh, or uh, these extreme storm events? You know, just... Like having rain, rain gardens or having cisterns or mm -hmm. having... Well, yeah, and, and there's lots of things. I mean, I'm upgrading my gutter systems. I'm putting underground drainage pipes in to get the water away from the house to the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, there's maybe... stuff the, that can be done. Maybe there's new house. There's a lot of stuff to try to keep it on your property. I mean, not in your house, but, it, you know... Yeah, yeah, just yeah, but I, I, I'm just asking the general question whether there are opportunities and maybe there aren't, but... This is... Questions. Yeah, this is something that um, certainly has been on our minds as staff, especially the last two years or so with the last two big floods. Um, yes, there are. I mean, it's always, there's a few things that come into play. I mean, a big one is, is just economics. So right now, typically, if you tear down a home, if you seek to construct a, uh, you know, a new home on that lot, we require you to put in um, about 1,000 gallons of stormwater detention on site. Right. So usually that takes the form of a big pipe. It chokes down to a smaller pipe that goes into the public storm system. The thinking being that's uh, essentially a pinprick. So if we have you know a whole street that redevelops in this way, you end up with 12, 14, 16,000 gallons that slowly filters into the system. Maybe we make up for some of these mistakes made along the way, if you would, or um, you know overcapacity issues. Um, that alone typically cost a homeowner in the neighborhood of $10,000 and up um, to install as part of their site work. So it's, it's hard, you know, at a certain point, you have to ask how much is enough for one homeowner to bear in, in terms of these bigger problems. Um, we do do, you know, drainage site plan reviews as it is. From time to time, that 1,000 gallons will go up bigger for larger sites or for more invasive work. And then, of course, um, I'm not the most literate at talking about it, but um, you know, there is watershed development rules as far as 
generally preventing you from building in the 100-year floodplain where it's known. Um, are there better things you could do? Probably. I mean, you, the simplest style is you could start turning up how much storage you require on site. That would probably do, you know, the most. Um, most of the things as far as coastal flooding, things like that, in theory, the Lake County Watershed Ordinance is supposed to be dealing with as it is, as far as where we know flooding is occurring, places like Campbell Court. Um, a lot of it is just capacity here locally. Um, as a smaller community, it's hard for us to really know sort of the, the more progressive things we could be doing in, in that world without being arbitrary. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, I'm just... Just it was a generic question, yeah. you know. I'm with you. It's it's good to look ahead because it doesn't seem like it's going to get better without our work. Yeah. So. You know, it's just a. I mean, there's always things you can think of. It's like I've done a number of things in my own home, and when we did an addition on the back of the home, because I'm on, I'm a little bit of a hill, but the water runs down. The the actual foundation walls are up eight inches higher than the rest of the house so that if it hits the house, it goes around and not into my basement. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are resiliency things. And mm -hmm. I know you do mention about how we've done surveys and advised homeowners how they can do things mm -hmm. to their own homes to minimize flooding. Uh, and I know, remember when George was here, he was talking to us about like your window wells, make sure you have covers on them, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that, the, that they haven't sunk into the ground. That was something when I first bought my house, the, mm -hmm. the window wells had sunk down so the water just leaked over when there was just even a little bit of water on the ground outside. So those are just, you know, resiliency of the, of the structures and homes. So. Okay, good. Very good. So last work topic, and then we'll, we'll let you get out of here. I thought this was going to be a relatively fast agenda, but we <laughs> we filled it up quite nicely. But we'll let you get on home. Um, so some work planning for the next um, period of time for the SEC. Um, again, this group has opted not to meet in um, December, since that would put you right after Christmas, right before New Year's, a little bit of an awkward time. Um, so we wanted to think uh, with you at least a little bit um, about a few different topics coming up. Um, the first would be um, if there was a time to look at changing your regular meeting date, this is probably the time to have that discussion so we can set the meeting schedule for 2019 um, with a different date in mind. Um, I, I don't know that we heard a lot of discussion on when that idea was floated back in October, but um, we're happy to work with the availability of this room. If there's a different day of the month that works better for um, people's schedules that maybe is a little easier to come by. Um, also an update on a few things hanging out there. So the um, Route 176 study, not quite ready for this evening. Um, we think that workshop, that final workshop will be held at the end of January. Similarly, we were hoping to have the Washington Park plans back here before us this evening. Unfortunately, one of the principals on that project had a death in the family, so um, we weren't able to um, have that here before you today, but again, that should be ready to go. Um, early on in 2019, whenever this committee is ready for it in their work plan. Um, the sustainability plan, um, I'm hoping to have it before, you know, your next meeting, I'm hoping to have a draft circulated to you by email or by print, your preference. That's um, probably 90, 95% of the way there, subject to your comments, to your review, approval, things like that. And then finally, I know it's hard to believe, but we're coming up on our one-year chicken hearing in uh in february march whenever you'd care to schedule it so nice things to think about well, it'd be good to have some press it in advance yes that people should have their applications in we did hear about um one gentleman that was interested a couple months ago who might be coming forward at that time I will tell you of the other of the two applications you heard later on, 419 East Prospect and then the Magnus Resonance. Neither one of those ended up um, pursuing no. it at this time. So you've still just got one in town out there on Lincoln. But she's, I, I went out there a couple months ago, took some photos. They're very happy. So the chickens or the people? Both. <laughs> Everybody's, Everybody's thrilled. Um, they said it would be interesting to see how the winter went for them, but I suppose we'll hear that when they come on back. Yeah, it would be good to do that in the in the winter rather than putting it till March, just so that as we learn through the process, yeah. people need to order, order up the chickens. Certainly. And prepare. 
Mm-hmm. And how about bees? We still haven't gotten any application. No interest in bees. So funny because there were so funny. many. Yeah. yeah. That was the thing that that was one. Oh, yeah. Oh well. It'll come. Yep. <clears throat> So I guess direction from this group would be, at least right now, sounds like January will be the final workshop. Um, I'm expecting we'll have those other discussions in February, and from the sounds of it, chickens in February too, if we can have that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then again, if there was a time to change your meeting scheduling, this would be the time for us to discuss that. Yeah. So we had been meeting on the Wednesdays, and I know there was one or two people who were discussing how that works for them. Um, we not only have to pick a day which works for all of us, but we have to not, in terms of village staff, running into other meetings and other issues with them preparing for these meetings. So I think we need to definitely kind of all get on the page for the same day of the month mm-hmm. and kind of stick to that. And does anyone have any Is comments? the fourth week um, necessitated by village schedules too? I mean, we're... It's the last. Um, it, it'd be easier to look at alternative dates, let's say. Uh, I mean, the big, there's sort of two things we're trying to balance. One is, you know, there's about 12 other meetings in this room, yeah. and so we need to be here if we want to be televised. Yeah. And the second is, um, between John and I, we staff half of those. <laughs> and so just the practicality of trying to be able to give each group the attention it deserves. That's why you get the big bucks. So besides Absolutely. the day we have now, what are the ones that work best for village staff as alternatives? Just so we get that out. Sure. So some options would be um, the first Wednesday or Thursday of the month is typically open. Okay. Okay. Um, the third Monday of the month you could do. And then the last Wednesday, of course. I suppose going back, really that first week of the month generally has a lot of openings, so you could do that first Monday, uh, the first Wednesday, the, th- the first Thursday pretty consistently. I'm okay with everything but the first Thursdays. Yeah, Thursday. yeah. Monday, Wednesday, that first week, I could, and the Monday of the third week is fine with me too, I don't know. I like if, it, if, it's, if it's the week rather than the day. Like if it's, if it's the first week of the month. That's much easier, right. I think. Then, like the f- last week of the month, which floats around, could be five or four. So, if it could be any of the first four weeks, it would, for me, that would be fine. I'd love it not to be Wednesdays, if possible. But About the first Monday or Tuesday? Yeah. 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 First Tuesday, we can't do. I mean, the first, first Monday? First Monday, first Wednesday, first Thursday. First Tuesdays month. is the architectural. My hearing first Monday is okay with everybody. Monday or Thursday, yeah. I should try. I travel a lot over the weekends, but you know, I don't know that that's going to affect I mean, a lot of people. Do that anyway. Me too. So, I know. You can try it. And you can I travel see. a lot too. Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. You said Tuesday was out, right? Yeah. First Tuesday. Tuesday's yeah. out. Tuesday will be the architectural <laughs> board. Tuesday's yeah, and I prefer not Thursdays. Um, yeah. Mondays are good. So first Monday. Is first happens. Monday better than second, third Wednesdays? Second Wednesday, third Wednesday are taken. Okay, all right. We'll do first or fourth, right? Yep, way. first or fourth. Did you say also say the, fir- the third Monday? Third week Monday. Yep, you could do the third Monday as well. That squeezes up on a few things, but that's available. That'd be great. The third Monday? What, what difference does... The what does is the first Monday or the third Monday make for anyone? It's just Mondays. It's tough because if you travel, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't care. Yeah. If we had a preference, we would say the first one, but we can make either work. Well, it sounds like we can maybe make the first Monday work. We try it and see what happens. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Okay. Okay. Well, preliminarily, you can pencil in, um, look towards January 7th then. We'll see if um, we'll want to make sure just that um, the... Route 176 study will be ready to go by that time. Okay. Um, and we'll go from there. I'll send you guys a confirmation when we have everything in place, probably the next week or two. So okay. we were on lighting and biking. When do we, what's the approach for getting both back on track with both of those? Definitely. I would suggest um, that probably between that set of projects we've laid out, January, February will be pretty tight to get through. 
Okay. Um, I, I would think it makes sense to revisit one or both in March. Okay. And then also, uh, knock on wood, you know, if, if your sustainability plan has gone to the village board since then, or by, by that time, um, either, you'll, either you'll still be talking about it and that'll take it up, or if it's gone for consideration, that lays out the blueprint for where these projects fit in. I think that gives, that gives you a, a clear, well-lit path. <laughs> okay. Sound good for everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that would um, conclude this item and our agenda. Okay. Um, any um, reports from the members or co-chair co about anything they want to bring up? On a personal note, there is a fascinating article about um, insects in the New York Times Magazine this weekend that I would encourage you to look at actually ties into some of your lighting discussions pretty well. So it talks about sort of the rapid decline in insect populations, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I had just one thing. Um, Lake County is uh, working on the um, idea of mitigating salt in the watersheds. And I was in a meeting that it turns out that some of the communities have sent their maintenance people for training. Have we sent ours for training on beet powder? juice? Is it beet juice that the, that's the alternative? That is uh -huh. the alternative, but just using the salt in better ways even can <clears throat> can help your community a great deal. And I didn't know if our people had been part of that or not. Uh, I know we've talked about it. I can't tell you if we've sent them, but I will. I'll get you an answer on that. I thought that it, it can make a great deal of difference. Yeah. Which I was surprised mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. And even um, having any kind of sensors on the pavement is more important than the amount of snow, mm. depending on mm -hmm. how cold the pavement is, mm. really determines how much salt you need. Mm -hmm. I learned so well, more, much at this meeting, I couldn't yeah. believe it. There is, um, yeah, so there's actually, if you want to learn something mildly interesting. Most depart departments of transportation use the same table on how much to put where from a study in like the early 2000s, but essentially the colder it gets, the more salt brine you put out, or you get into the harder stuff, your calcium chlorides, chlorates, things of that nature. Um, so some agencies use beet juice um, to help as an alternative. It's, it's kind of interesting if you like chemistry, I guess, but yeah. So, but we'll take a look. Again, I know we've we've talked about it. I can't tell you whether or not we've sent somebody there, but um, I'll take a look. We'll get you an answer back. Okay. Okay. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Merry Christmas. <laughs> or Betty. Yeah. This is a long one. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving. I like it when there's...